This episode is presented by Visible Alpha. The team at Visible Alpha built the platform to analyze consensus data and financial metrics on over 6,000 publicly traded companies. Rather than digging through models one by one, Visible Alpha extracts data from every line item across sell-side models so you can better understand expectations on metrics beyond just revenue and earnings. Listeners are invited to try Visible Alpha for free by visiting visiblealpha.com slash breakdowns. This episode is brought to you by MIT Investment Management Company, also known as Matimco. As the endowment office of MIT, Matimco searches for investment firms that are focused on achieving exceptional long-term investment returns. Matimco's goal is to create long-term relationships. They will partner with firms as early as day one and do not ask for general partner economics in return. Visit Matimco's website to learn more about their unconventional emerging manager approach, including examples of managers they have backed. While they only partner with a handful of new firms each year, they have also created and published resources for the broader universe of emerging managers to benefit from, making them even more unusual in the LP world. Matimco also opportunistically hires new members for their investment team. The Matimco team spends their time learning about great businesses and investments, working with exceptional investors around the world in order to support generations of MIT innovators. Visit matimco.org, M-I-T-I-M-C-O.org to learn more. Click join to learn more about the global investor role on Matimco's team and click emerging managers to learn more about their emerging manager activities. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Matt Russell, and today we are breaking down Cadence Design Systems. Cadence operates in the semiconductor ecosystem, where they offer electronic design automation software, also known as EDA software, which is used for chip design. Now, putting that in much simpler terms... Our phones now carry an entire 1980s Radio Shack inside them, and Cadence makes that possible with software to design smaller and more powerful chips. To break down Cadence, I'm joined by two well-known tech investors and specifically experts in the semiconductor space, Britton Johns and John Bathgate of NZS Capital. We cover the value chain of semiconductors, the evolution of Cadence in the EDA market, and how Cadence reduced its cyclical exposure over the last decade. I think some of the most interesting lessons come from businesses that face adversity and truly reinvent themselves with a micro strategic change. Cadence is a prime example. Please enjoy this breakdown of Cadence. All right, Britton and John, thanks for joining us on Business Breakdowns. Hey, Matt, thanks for having us. So I'm personally excited for this breakdown. I spent my career as an investor dedicated to energy and industrials. So it always felt like we were the Sunday matinee and software and tech was the primetime programming. So I thought a good place to start with Cadence, where it sits at this interesting intersection of software and hardware. It's a $40 billion company at the time of this recording, but by no means a household name. So I thought maybe we could start working backwards. And Britton, I'll start with you. Can you share a product that I interact with on a day-to-day basis and how Cadence plays a role in bringing that product to life? Well, first of all, thanks for saying that we're main event because John and I, as semiconductor analysts, really, most of the time, we felt more like the redheaded stepchild than the main event. <laughs> That's very flattering. If you think about your phone, let's just use an iPhone, and we work backwards, then this device, of course, has a lot of chips inside of it. Those chips, a lot of them are now designed by Apple itself, an OEM that became a chip maker. A lot of them are designed by other companies. They're made at TSMC or Samsung, but probably mostly TSMC. And then they are made by semiconductor equipment. So we think about ASML and KLA and AMAT. And then we sort of work back and they've got memory in it, which is a different kind of chip. And then all the way back, and sort of the linking factor throughout all of these things is 
you have to have a tool to design all those chips on. I'm going to simplify it. John will give a more nuanced answer. But there's really only two companies in the world that do that. And this is the tool that engineers live on every day, all day long. Every company that designs chips has it. And it's integral to the way the world works today. You described it well, Britton. I think if you think about a knowledge worker, or like if you're working in financial services and you come sit at your desk every day, you probably are working in Microsoft Office and Excel or PowerPoint, unfortunately, I would say. If you're creative, you're probably in the Adobe suites, you're working on Photoshop or Illustrator. And EDA tools, so tools from Cadence and their, their closest competitor, Synopsys, are kind of the productivity tools for designing a chip. One way you can think about how the software actually works is the end result, what you're trying to produce, is really a blueprint for a chip. If you think about a company like Autodesk that provides the software for architecture and engineering, when you're trying to build a house and you're trying to build a blueprint for that house, in semiconductors, you're also trying to build a house and a blueprint, but you've got 60 billion rooms in that house, and each room in the house is one ten thousandth the width of a human hair. That's kind of the starting point of what EDA software is. It's, it's highly, highly technical. It's kind of this productivity platform and design platform for designing a chip. And to Britain's point, they partner with the chip designer, which would be an engineer at someone like Apple, which is a systems company that designs their own chips or household chip design names, someone like NVIDIA or Intel or AMD. So some broader context on just how the industry works. So semiconductors, to Britain's point, it's a $550 billion industry. Roughly 15% of chip industry sales are spent on R&D. It's a very highly R&D intensive industry. And actually 15% of that, give or take, is spent on EDA tools. So take 15% squared is 2.25%, I think, going back to my math degree. That gets you to about a $10 billion market for EDA software. What I think is kind of fascinating about EDA software is... You have a $10 billion industry. Cadence has, give or take, a third of that market. You have this $550 billion industry sitting on top of, of EDA software and semiconductors where you literally cannot build a chip or design a chip without this mission-critical software. You abstract that one more level and you think about, I mean, smartphones are a $400 billion industry. PCs are a $250 billion industry. You've got hundreds of billions of dollars going into the cloud. We've kind of realized that you can't build a car now without semiconductors go to medical devices and this long tail of things that are built on chips. And so it kind of feels like the whole global economy that's going digital, which I would argue is most of the economy at this point, is kind of built on the shoulders of these two special companies, which are Cadence and Synopsys. And that's why we're excited to talk about it. So I mean, to sum it up, just very simply, this is one of the most important companies you've never heard of. No, I think that puts it well. It's great framing and credible that you don't hear about a business like this that sits at a such an interesting intersection. Maybe we can go back in time and talk a little bit about the origins of the semiconductor industry, but really the rise of cadence. Was this always something that was done outsourced? Is this something that's vertically integrated at any of the chip manufacturers, designers? How did they start this business? And maybe talk a little bit more about the origins of cadence. I can start with that when semiconductors came out of Bell Labs. And in the very beginning, the companies that were doing it uh, Bell Labs and, and TI and and others, their original companies in Silicon Valley, were doing everything. They were doing their own equipment. They were certainly writing all of their own software. And so for a long time, this software just lived inside of the largest semiconductor makers. You know, Intel had their own software and process flow, and TSMC had their own process flow and others. And then, like we've seen everywhere in the semiconductor industry, they have specialized. And through time, they've consolidated and they power a lot. We look at photolithography, and we've talked about this before, but with what's making the latest chips, it's called EUV. There's only one company that does that. We look sort of down the stack. We keep seeing one or two, maybe three, but usually one or two with a lion's share. And we go to EDA software, and it has also now come out of the companies, the IDMs, the integrated device manufacturers, and gone into specialized companies like Cadence and Synopsys and Mentor, and has become incredibly important and very sophisticated. Cadence specifically, so they were formed by the merger of two EDA companies, ECAD and SDA, which I think are kind of trivia questions in the semiconductor industry now. Cadence was formed in 1989. And what's interesting about the forming of Cadence is it was kind of where the semiconductor industry had gone from vertical integration model of everything, everyone doing them, everything themselves to Britain's point to specialization. And it also coincides with when TSMC was founded in the 80s and also when some of the major equipment manufacturers like ASML and LAM Research were also founded. 
So I think part of it was the writing was on the wall a little bit, like in the 70s and early 80s, the number of transistors in a given chip was in the thousands. You could see with the progression of Moore's law that that number was doubling in density every two years, basically, that things were going to get extremely complex very quickly. That's why you kind of had this interest in disaggregating this vertical integration model. And then also, I would say it democratized the chip business because it made it possible for someone whether it's a vertically integrated equipment maker or like end device maker or just a group of engineers to come in and start a company because all of a sudden you don't need millions of dollars to build a factory and build your own internal tools and build the equipment. You can just buy the software from Cadence and partner with TSMC to actually build your design. And so that's kind of the founding story. I think it's so interesting as it coincides with this disaggregation of the vertical integration model in, in semiconductor land. Yeah. And if we go back to that point in the 80s, I mean, where did the semiconductor industry stand in terms of major players? And I think we stand at a duopoly today, but what did it look like back then? Were there a lot of smaller players in the space? So on the EDA front, it's actually interesting. There are kind of big three players in, in EDA. So it's Cadence and Synopsys. And then the third one that was around for a long time is called Mentor Graphics. And Mentor was acquired by Siemens in 2015 or so. And so just since their financials aren't public anymore, I feel like they're less visible than the other two. But what's interesting is the major three players were kind of in existence in the 80s, and they all kind of followed this playbook. There was a lot of M&A. Um, there were a lot of you know, people would run out and start an EDA company and get acquired for... I mean, back then it was like tens of millions of dollars, which was a big deal in a software acquisition, which is kind of funny. And then the way that their business models evolved, and this was also in the context, I should say, in the semiconductor industry was probably $75 billion in sales. I mean, the PCs were ramping, but weren't by any means ubiquitous. Like we did not have smartphones. Like if you think about a lot of the devices that are enabled by semiconductors, certainly was not the world we're living in now. Yeah. And then just to think about the companies themselves, and John made this excellent point before about the way that we produce semiconductors has become democratized. And, you know, we think about these large fabulous companies like NVIDIA, over half a trillion dollar market cap, really wouldn't exist without this democratization. And that's also enabling, you know, we talked about Apple at the very beginning, becoming a chip maker. That's not possible also without this democratization. It's enabling other companies that have never made chips, never thought about making chips to get into the production of chips now and bring on their own design teams. And that's very different behavior than we've seen even 10 years ago. Yeah, maybe you could walk us through the process. I think you touched on this a little bit in one of your previous answers, but if a company like Apple wants to actually get into the designing of a chip, can you walk us through what the cycle of that looks like all the way from initial plans, how they integrate cadence, working with a chip manufacturer and then into production? Sure. There's a couple of good examples. And I'll start at, think about Apple or even Amazon for that matter. Apple bought PA Semiconductor in 2008. It was a relatively small transaction and from Apple terms, hundreds of millions of dollars, not billions. We look at what they've done with it over time, you know, of course, making the application processor and now all the way to displacing Intel into their PCs with the M1 chip. That's an ARM-based chip. You hire a team of engineers, you use these tools, Cadence and Synopsys, you develop IP over time and then get it fabbed at TSMC, start a relationship directly with TSMC. And then and then that chip then goes to Foxconn. They put your phone together and it gets shipped straight to the customer, right? Most of the time, the brand isn't even touching the device. It's sort of fascinating. And, and also, one of the areas we haven't hit on yet that's been democratized is IP blocks and John can talk about this a lot more, but just one important point to make is in semiconductors, there is no GitHub of IP. It's distributed around a lot of different companies. Developing your own IP is important, but most of the chip is still IP blocks that you're sourcing from other places, and you have to deal with several companies to get those. This IP point is really important. So the basic building blocks for Building a chip is a great team, to Britain's point, and you need the basic tools, the EDA tools from Cadence or Synopsys. On the IP front, most designs, especially in kind of digital semiconductors for a smartphone in this example, use what you call like off-the-shelf IP, where you actually license intellectual property from a third party. And so Arm Holdings, which is in the news daily right now because of the failed acquisition attempt by NVIDIA provides that IP. And so for the processor that is in your, your iPhone or in your Mac and MacBook and iPad now, the architecture, the instruction set for that chip was actually licensed from ARM. And then Apple will take their thousands of engineers 
And literally, I mean, one point that I think is noteworthy on a leading edge chip, like we're talking about with Apple, where they're using the most kind of advanced process technology out there. The cost of designing these chips is in the high hundreds of millions of dollars for a five nanometer chip, which is the leading edge. Right now, there's numbers out there from McKinsey or Gartner or other third parties that would put that number at over $500 million. The basics of designing the chip are incorporating these third-party IP blocks, which is almost like Legos. Like a lot of the process now is actually taking even something as simple as if you want to have USB in the chip, like USB is actually not that differentiated. You don't need to, or USB compatibility, I would say. And so you don't need to like invent the next USB. You just need something that is going to charge when you plug it in. The device will understand how that process works. So that's something they could actually license from a company like Cadence or Synopsys. It's kind of a multi-year journey. You put the IP blocks together. You actually do a lot of simulation on the chip, both in software and actually in hardware. There are tools where Cadence does very well called emulation tools. You actually will run really heavy simulation. It looks just like a server rack or a racks of servers, like a server container to actually simulate the chip to make sure it'll work. The way the process works is at the end of designing the chip, it's called taping it out. So you tape out the design, then you have to put that into a photo mask, which is kind of the stencil for the chip, or it's like the negative. If you're thinking about like a negative of an old photo or something like that. And those, even the masks themselves cost $10 million now. And so the, the cost of failure on one of these designs is very high. And so that's part of the reason why these tools are so uh, critically important. First of all, they're enabling a lot of innovation, but also you have to really trust the tools that you're going to um, come out with the outcome that you're shooting for. And so once you had the photo mask, you actually would pass that on to your manufacturing partner. And so one of the things we haven't really gone into is just the different kinds of chip companies. So Britain mentioned fabless companies. That'd be someone like NVIDIA, where a fab is the term for chip manufacturing facility. It's short for a fabrication facility. And so a fabless company is a company like NVIDIA that designs the chips, but they do not own their manufacturing. And that's different from what's called an IDM, which is the Intel model, which is integrated device manufacturer. And that's where manufacturing and design are still incorporated in the same company. And so um, it, it is important to distinguish those two. So if you were at NVIDIA, you would hand off that design in the photo mask to your manufacturing partner, which is TSMC. Or if you were Intel, you would hand that off to your manufacturing group, which is obviously you know, inside of Intel. There's a lot to unpack there. That's really helpful. <laughs> if we step back to laying out Apple and spending north of 100 million up to 500 million in terms of this chip design, what's the life cycle of that chip? And maybe we can use it in iPhone terms. Are we talking about a single iPhone series or from 13 to 15? Uh, what does that look like? Generally, it lasts for one to two years. So there'll be like whatever it is, the A10X and then the A10X Bionic. And there kind of are like subversions of each chip, but partly because Apple is generally following Moore's law. And so they're basically trying to move your manufacturing technology to the extent that TSMC can push down Moore's law. And so TSMC generally will introduce a new node every two years. And they'll even introduce kind of like a half node every year. Sometimes it's not like they're redesigning the chip from scratch because there are, there's just a lot of overlap between the chip that powered the iPhone from two years ago versus now. But there are a lot of incremental changes, whether that's putting more artificial intelligence engines onto the chip. I mean, obviously, the feature sizes are smaller. So you either have a chip that's the same size that's more powerful, or you have a chip that's smaller that uses the same amount of power. Just to be clear, it's a treadmill. This treadmill is going to go on for as long as humans continue to progress, because the way we're progressing digitally is fueled by semiconductors getting faster and smarter and sort of everything we're building on top of that, whether it's AI or network connections at the edge or autonomous driving or you name it, it's all based on the same sort of base layer building blocks of these quicker, more capable chips. And I mean, Apple's kind of the ultimate treadmill example or the smartphone industry is just because the velocity of the device cycles is so quick that, you know, every year Apple has to introduce the next greatest thing in, in September and delight the world again. If you're designing a chip for car, it's usually is intended to last for the model life of the car. So that could be five to 10 years. And those generally would be, or in most cases, less expensive chips that don't take teams of thousands of people and hundreds of millions of dollars. They're kind of middle ground. Like if you're designing a chip for a 5G base station or for a server, I think those can last multiple years also. And so there is like a little bit longer tail. Um, other applications and semiconductors, just generally mobile and consumer tend to have the highest pace of, of design cycles. That makes a ton of sense. To level set and make sure that I understand the software properly for Cadence, 
I can understand the idea of developing what this chip looks like, exactly where certain things may be on that chip, printing out that blueprint and shipping it off. But it sounds like there's some element of software that actually powers the chip as well. Am I thinking about that right, that there's both the software design studio and then software that's actually running the chip once it's in whichever device it's running? It's actually kind of a not very well-known thing outside of like the semiconductor industry that if you look at a company like NVIDIA, they actually have more software engineers than they have hardware engineers now. And so they would use the software from Cadence or Synopsys to actually design the chip. And then when the software that would actually help power the chip, it's called embedded software, like it's not really facing the outside world. That actually is developed in-house, but there is like some special sauce in embedded software in the way that systems can operate. And that's developed by the chip company themselves generally. Yeah, I think this is a really important point, and it's increasingly important because what you're seeing, I know we're talking a lot about a, a lot of different companies except for Cadence, and you came to the show today for Cadence. <laughs> we'll get there, yeah. The ecosystem is just getting tighter and tighter. And so these companies really don't work in isolation. And so when we think about Cadence doing the software design chip and then this tight integration between the software, whether it's NVIDIA or Apple or whoever, on top of that, then there's also a lot of work that goes in to before the chip is designed on simulation and before the device is designed on simulation and verification. And that's sort of a whole host of other companies as well. Um, these chip companies are starting to partner with more simulation companies like Ansys or so or Ansoft, which is inside of Ansys Legacy, just to make sure you don't make any mistakes. Once you develop that mask and you put the hard copy in place and then you start printing chips, it's too late. <laughs> That's a really, really expensive mistake. So you don't want to do that. So the integration in the ecosystem, because it's just so stupid hard, is tighter than ever. That's quite impressive. It's a good opportunity to transition over to Cadence. Maybe you can give just a high level overview of the size of the business today. You gave us a little bit about the background of when they were founded, but maybe bringing us up to the current day and some of the key pivotal moments over that time, just to sketch out Cadence over the past 20 plus years and some of the memorable moments. Yeah, yeah I think maybe we can talk about the history first and then pivot over to the uh, financials after that. And so I guess we started in 1989, got kind of sidetracked talking about the whole ecosystem. If you kind of just wanted to sum up the 90s and some of the 2000s for Cadence, it was going from like being able to do very specific parts of the chip design process to building what's called a full flow. And that means if you were designing a chip from soup to nuts, you can do the entire thing on the Cadence platform. And really, that was the goal of Cadence and Synopsys is to put together this full design flow so that you could be kind of the one-stop shop for designing a chip. Even though, to be honest, most companies use Cadence and Synopsys tools, they're both have proliferated at any medium to large size chip company. That was kind of the goal for each of them is to be the one-stop shop. So the 2000s were kind of an interesting time for the company, just because in 2004, Cadence hired a CEO out of Intel named Mike Fister. To be honest, the company's kind of lost focus for a handful of years. And so they had really big problems with pricing. They were extending the duration on their contracts for a really long period of time. I think just to honestly make near-term quarterly numbers. They had a um, bid out to acquire Mentor Graphics, and they actually were pursuing going, going private at the same time through, I think, KKR, the private equity boom of the 2000s. The reason that's relevant is that culminated in the whole management team being wiped out in 2008, Mike and all of his inner circle was all resigned from the company. And this was kind of on the brink of the financial crisis. And so they put in the board elected Lip Bhutan as the interim CEO. He was already on the board. He's actually been a venture capitalist in semiconductors for a long time. But GFC, the stock went to less than $3 a share. And there were times, you know, people in the industry, if you go back and read articles from this happening, I mean, people thought that Cadence might not be repairable, which was, I mean, a big deal for the semiconductor industry and a big deal for Cadence, obviously. The company, Lipu and his management team had to embark on really fixing the business. And so the first thing they did is they actually transitioned to a subscription revenue recognition model. And so, and Synopsys had done this too in the 2000s, Adobe and Autodesk and a lot of software companies have gone through subscription transitions over the last 10 years and they brought those into vogue with the original software companies to pull off these subscription transitions were actually Cadence and Synopsys. And the reason they did it is because anyone that's been in EDA for a long time will describe this process that at the end of the quarter, the customer like an Intel or Texas Instruments knows that the EDA guy needs to make his monthly or his quarterly numbers. And so they would just hang them out to dry and really push them hard on pricing. And so 
you had some really destructive pricing practices in EDA for a long time. And, and I think the turnaround of Cadence, getting them onto a subscription model was a really important part of that process. What's interesting about the turnaround also, from my perspective at least, is Lipu stabilized the business. They got to a recurring revenue model. Economy recovered in semiconductor, the semiconductor industry and their customer base recovered. And then instead of, I wouldn't say milking it, but um, taking his foot off the gas a little bit, they actually reinvested really aggressively into the business in kind of the early half of last decade. They've always been really good on analog and these cheaper, less sophisticated chips where you would sell to someone like a Texas Instruments or analog devices. But they pushed really heavily into digital. And they said, we're going to take on Synopsys head-to-head in their backyard and, and try to win the, the NVIDIAs and Intels and Apples of the world. I guess a few industry things that are noteworthy to kind of get us to where Cadence is today is the middle of the 2010s, there was just a lot going on in the semiconductor industry that really directly impacted EDA. The first one is actually Cadence's customer base started consolidating. So you had this massive wave in semiconductor consolidation from 2014 to 2017, where you would have hundreds of billions of dollars of M&A over, over that period of time. And there was a big concern back then that you're going to have larger more fierce, more powerful customers to negotiate with. And also they're trying to get synergies from all these acquisitions. And are you going to have actually fewer engineers to sell Cadence software to? And it turned out that through all these consolidations, no one fired their engineers because that's what you're buying when you buy a chip company. The lifeblood of the organization is the engineering force. So it actually turned out that the semiconductor industry got healthier. They were more profitable through the cycle and they could just keep investing in R&D. And that's kind of where Cadence gets paid at the end of the day. Last decade, and then I'll pause on this long history lesson is you really saw the systems companies get into the market. And so a systems company would be a vertically integrated tech platform or even non-tech now. If you look at Tesla, I don't know if you consider Tesla a tech company or an automotive company, but you really saw the emergence of more companies moving into their own silicon design. And so Apple was early on this and they moved into the market in 2008. But Amazon bought a company called Annapurna Labs in 2015. And they've since at least 10x to that headcount. Google has moved into designing chips. And we're actually at the point now where if you look at the top 10 most valuable companies in the world, eight of them design their own semiconductors. So the only ones out of the top 10 are Saudi Aramco and Berkshire that don't design their own chips. And Berkshire, I would give half credit since Apple's a big part of their valuation anyway. But it's just amazing, like this democratization or proliferation in semiconductor design and every large platform feeling the need to be in the semiconductor market. It's more dollars into the R&D bucket that Cadence gets paid out of. The thing that's helpful for Cadence also is a lot of these companies are starting from scratch, and so they need to buy more. If you're a chip company, you've got 20 years of IP libraries and things like that. But if you're Google, you have to lean more heavily on partners like a Cadence or even an Arm to provide the IP to get the chips off the ground. That kind of takes us to where we are today. So Cadence is $3 billion in, in revenue, and we can kind of talk through the financial model, but maybe I'll pause there on the history. 10 years ago, this was not obvious. <laughs> These were pretty bad businesses all in. The operating margins weren't very high. There's a lot of piracy with the software. I remember being on a plane, going to China, sitting next to the guy. I'm like, hey, how's it going? He's like, terrible. I'm like, why is it so terrible? He's like, because I'm about to go to China. He was a sales rep for Mentor. He's like, I'm going to try to sell my software, but I'm going to go to the market and see it for $15.99 sitting there on the shelf. So it's changed quite a bit. And if we had sort of a wall of fame and NCS, I mean, a picture of Le Boutin with like a garland around it or something would be right on the wall. <laughs> he's, he's one of our heroes of all time. Yeah, I want to break down a few of those points. And I think if we start with the customer base and giving us an understanding of exactly who that is, should I assume it's those eight out of 10 largest companies by market cap? Or are they working more directly with the TSMCs and the manufacturers? Who is the customer and are they overly concentrated in, in one specific industry? It's really all of those people are their customers. And, and the surprise to us anyway, over the past 15 years is the amount the customers has grown. Because I mean, like John talked about it, there was this, a lot of consolidation. You have sort of OEMs or systems companies getting chip designs, but there was a concern it was just going to be like a standing wave. You would get sort of zero revenue growth. But what's happened is everyone has recognized, oh, actually, the thing that makes us different is chip level design. So whether it's Annapurna Labs developing the Graviton or now Inferentia or all these like really interesting chips that Amazon is coming out with or TensorFlow from Google, the chips we've talked about with Apple or others. I mean, even Ford is talking about designing their own chips 
which is sort of like hell freezing over to me. I just never expected that. Fantastic for companies like Cadence and Synopsys. So their customer list is really growing. The other thing that we didn't talk about is for most of our careers, VC investing into semiconductor was like saying a white hippopotamus wearing plaid. It's like you'd never see it. But that's really changed. And John pointed out some numbers to me yesterday. I think it was $8 billion in the most recent year, John, for VC investment in SMEs. It was around $8 billion. I think it was probably in the low $1 billion-ish range like six or seven years ago. So it's VC investment is basically six or seven X in the last five or seven years. They're actually unicorns in semiconductors now, which is amazing. And also, I think it is injecting a little bit of one of the risks in semiconductors is is not a very sexy field compared to working at a big software company or working in a cloud or at a big tech platform. And so I think seeing some success, both of some of the public companies like the NVIDIAs and AMDs, but also seeing unicorns and startups and exits that are healthy is just good for the overall ecosystem. And Matt, I think part of your question on like who is paying who, so the customers of Cadence, this is always confusing, I think, in the semiconductor ecosystem. The customers of Cadence are everyone designing their own chips. So that'd be Apple or in this top 10 list, you know, it's Apple, Google, NVIDIA is actually in the top 10 most valuable companies in the world now, Samsung, in their R&D budgets behind headcount, most expensive part of their R&D budgets is paying Cadence and Synopsys for the tools. And then those companies will also be paying TSMC to actually build the chips to actually fabricate them. And that comes out of their cost of sales. Going back in time to the management change, and the subscription revenue model before it was this sexy, well-adopted thing that I think in hindsight looks obvious. Can you talk a little bit about what a contract actually looks like for Cadence and a customer and the terms of that? And coming from the outside, I would think of this as this would be project-based. There's some development of a chip. And once that work is done, it's like my architect, he's paid and done and we're over with. They've built a reoccurring revenue model with these customers, which I'm sure could be tied into the constant development of new chips. But it sounds like there's an ongoing revenue stream from existing chips as well. So giving a little bit of a background on the contract structure and how much that's changed over time would also be helpful. Their contracts are three year. They recognize the revenue rapidly over three years. Their revenue will follow design starts to some extent. A design start is when you actually start designing a chip, like you form a team. And once you have all those team together, um, you have the band together, everyone needs the EDA tools. But there's like this overarching relationship with the end company, because if your text instruments is maybe a good example, they don't do the bleeding edge chips, but they have 76 business units. They're trying to come out with hundreds of new products every year. And so within any of these companies, even the really big companies, they're only doing a handful of really big chips a year, like Apple or you know, NVIDIA, where they're trying to have a blockbuster design every few years. They're just kind of constant design activity. And so it is a good question because they do follow kind of this like design start mentality. The customer pays on a per seat basis. And one thing about EDA software is there's so many different products and configurations of what you need, what you don't need, that they're kind of not like a vanilla number for just to get a cadence license is $100,000 or something like that. But it generally is in like the tens of thousands of dollars per seat in terms of what's needed to actually spin up a uh, chip design on a per person basis. It might be interesting also, John, to talk about S curves they've layered on to their core business and how they've grown the TAM over time, whether that's simulation or verification or emulation or, or even IP blocks. This is another thing that Cadence kind of embarked on in their turnaround plan is I think the way the semiconductor industry was moving was to this, again, in this kind of like horizontal model is more licensing of IP. And so ARM Holdings emerged as kind of a behemoth, especially they did the core architecture for smartphones. And so when kind of we saw the mobile revolution, ARM really took off and Cadence realized that they were behind in this market. And actually, if you look at the third party estimates on what's going on in, in the EDA ecosystem, IP is the fastest growing part of, of EDA now. And so Cadence actually went out and bought a handful of companies in the early 2010s. And then they bought a company called Tensilica in the middle of last decade that's actually really good in audio. So for high performance audio, which has really taken off with AirPods and things like that. And they can actually leverage that into more like artificial intelligence applications, like even autonomous driving, like autonomous drones and things like that. That was a big push for the company and they've done a really good job of actually building. It's, it's about 15% of sales now and growing healthy mid-teens, high teens. And that's been a nice add-on. And then we talked a little bit about this business called emulation where it's big 
racks on racks of servers that were a, a big company. If you're simulating one of these $500 million chips, you actually kind of like load your chip design into their system to actually make sure that it, first of all, works the way you want it to. And also you can actually kind of speed up the time to market. Like one of the things you have to think about is their software that runs the chip. Apple has to make sure that their embedded software and their vision of how the chip is going to work internally is actually going to work. And to the extent that they can speed that up and have the software ready by September of every year to get the next iPhone out, that's actually extremely helpful. And it can speed up their time to market to be able to actually like model the way that software would work before you have the physical chip built. Yeah. So actually, before you get the chip, you're doing what's called hardware in the loop simulation where you're emulating this chip on these racks of servers and making sure everything works together so that when you do get that shiny chip back from the fab and it goes to that system integrator, whoever that is, on high or flex or someone like that, it all just works. On the licensed business, is it fair to think about that like an off-the-shelf solution that they're providing? And is there some type of patent that protects it from being robbed or borrowed, as you were referencing, Britain? Well, there's two different kinds of IP blocks. And really, the goal is to have off-the-shelf IP blocks. In the past, there were a lot of custom IP blocks that were tougher to resell. They've gotten away from that to some extent and gotten to more of these sort of off-the-shelf IP blocks. Usually, if it's custom IP, then the company's going to own that and spend a lot of time on it. So we see this, like John said, in multiple places. It's a cadence and synopsis. It's also with an arm and then scattered around in this and so and other companies as well. Maybe we can talk about the economics of the business now. It's a good place to transition. What does that look like in terms of just their operating model? For my brief research, it looks like they're getting software-like margins, gross margins for the business. But maybe talk us through what that looks like in terms of a sale and, and what they're generating, what goes into R&D and all the relevant numbers. One way that's helpful to actually tie all the things that Britton and I are talking about tie together, or you can actually just look at Cadence as revenue growth as a starting point. And if you go back five or six years, they were growing mid to high single digits. And that's actually accelerated pretty nicely to there's kind of been some lumpiness the last few years. So the company would direct you to kind of like their three year revenue kager, and it's accelerated to 13% healthy low teens revenue growth. And so I do think that's the combination of systems companies coming into the market. And that's actually growing as a share of Cadence's overall revenue. It's about 45% of the business now. And a few years ago, it was about 38% of the business. I also think they're doing really well in digital, like we talked about. If you go back to their efforts from almost 10 years ago to establish themselves with the NVIDIAs and Intels and, and Apple of the world are doing really well. Quick question on the revenue side of things and what you were talking about, the revenue kager. How correlated is revenue to just the broader semiconductor market and semiconductor cycles? I think one of the beauties of the business, and I think the reason that Cadence, I mean, like you said, it's not really a household name, but it has gotten a pretty healthy multiple the last few years, is they show basically no cyclicality to the semiconductor cycle. And so if you go back, if you think about the last 10 years, we've actually had three semiconductor cycles. We had one actually after the financial crisis, 2011 through 2013. And there was a, another one in 2015 and 16. And then around the Chinese trade wars, and that actually kind of bled into COVID as a third cycle. So Cadence's slowest annual revenue growth through those three cycles is probably 6% in a given year. I think what we learned, and this goes back to the consolidation conversation a little bit, is one, if you're running a chip company, even if you're cutting costs, the very last thing you'll cut is R&D organization, cutting design starts. First of all, it takes like two years to get a chip designed and out into the market. So if you're cutting something now, you're sacrificing your future and your future growth. But it's also just the lifeblood of your organization. And so it turns out as their customers consolidated, they actually had pretty good margins through the cycle and there was no pressure to cut R&D. That is, I think, why... The stock has gotten the multiple expansion it's gotten is because it's a way I think people have woken up to the secular growth of the semiconductor industry. And it's a way to capitalize on the secular trend they're driving the growth in the industry without having to worry about cyclicality. And then to be fair to Cadence, the semiconductor industry growth is probably growing between six and eight percent, depending on your starting point. And they're growing well above that. And that's these add ons, both that they're gaining share. You've got the cloud companies coming in doing in their own chips. They've got the IP business. They've got hardware. And so you kind of roll that up and you kind of get better than semi-industry growth without the cyclicality. It's a really important point because if you think about sort of like the most volatile parts of the semiconductor ecosystem, which set the rule for how people think about it, you get to like DRAM and NAND memory, really volatile pricing moves around a lot based on supply and demand. 
And then you think about maybe Simicap equipment. Hey, I don't really need to buy that machine this quarter. Or maybe I could delay it to next quarter. And sort of you go down the list. And the last thing you get to is, oh, we have to fire all of our engineers. <laughs> that means your company's about to go bankrupt. It's just the last thing you're ever going to do. And so Cadence gets lumped in in Synopsys. EDA gets lumped in with that sometimes, but it's really not a fair comparison. I'd be curious going back to before I interrupt you, the economics and how it runs through the income statement, really the cash flow statement, I would think that a business like this, where a lot of this is customer based, project based, where they could potentially tie a lot of the R&D work they're doing into a contract that they have, so they're not spending a lot on spec. But I don't know if that's a fair assumption. Maybe we could just revisit the economics and what the margin profile of this business looks like, and how much of that flows through to free cash flow. I mean, what jumps out if you look at the P&L is they spend 35% of sales on R&D. I think it's literally the most R&D intensive business in the world at scale. Like you could take a an earlier stage technical software company and maybe they would eclipse Cadence. But given that business is at relative maturity, it is amazing how R&D intensive it is, even relative to other technical software companies like Dassault or, or Autodesk or CAD or simulation companies or Ansys for that matter. It's a lot less sales and marketing, especially compared to more growth software, in part because every chip company works with Cadence and Synopsys. Like they literally have like 0% churn. Like churn is not even a metric that is brought up for these guys because unless their customer goes out of business, there's no churn. And so it does bleed through to really healthy margins. So they actually just got it this week since they reported earlier this week in late February to high 30s operating margins it translates to kind of like low 30s free cash flow margins. And I think the management team deserves a lot of credit for you asked about what scales and what doesn't scale. I think they've really focused the business on what scales well and what something. I mean, the, obviously, the benefit of software is you design it once and sell it many times. So the extent that you can do that on a relatively standardized basis for, versus doing something that's more customized for a given customer, they've done very well with. And so they've actually been able to accelerate their revenue growth while sticking to a really impressive 50% incremental operating margin, loose target. And they, they've hit that every year the last five or six years. The economics of the business have been just steadily getting better and I think reached where you'd expect them to get relative to appear like an ANSYS that's in the low 40s for operating margins. And then on kind of a rule of 40 basis, they've also improved where now they're probably in the high 40s if you match up their free cash flow margin with their revenue growth. So it's kind of like what people think a software business should look like at scale and at maturity, like approaching 40% operating margins, probably with some headroom, to be honest, if they can keep on this trajectory. And it's just very, very predictable, like coming into any given year. 85 to 90% of the revenue is recurring. They've got some hardware that I mentioned that might move them all around a little bit. And so unless you've got a nuclear winner type scenario where people start canceling their chip designs, then you're in pretty good shape. And even then, like the lumpiness in the model gets sorted out over three years because it's a three-year subscription RevRec model. And is the growth in that revenue coming from more licenses at existing clients? Is it coming from new logos? Are they implementing pricing on customers. I understand there's a ton going on in terms of development, but where does that show up? How does it translate? I'm really curious too on the pricing point about how that's evolved over time. I mentioned this a little bit, but pricing really plagued the industry years ago. And even after Cadence and Synopsys transitioned to a subscription model, they still did not have really healthy pricing. And it's just taken, I think, multiple iterations of honestly different management, different sales leaders and different people. And so now they've gotten to the point where pricing is pretty positive. I think both companies are a little bit cagey about talking about pricing publicly. I think in part, they don't want to piss off their customers. And in part, there's only two companies left. I don't think they want to draw any regulatory red flags or anything like that. But I would say pricing is a modest tailwind in relative to where it was historically, where it was probably a headwind to revenue growth. It's certainly a pretty big swing factor over the last seven or eight years. I would say their biggest driver of growth, one thing is just designing semiconductors is very R&D intensive. And so every year, as Apple goes from five nanometer to three nanometer, which is the next process node, that design will be significantly more expensive. And so it just takes more people and more tools to build the next generation of chips. And then you have seen, there are two drivers, I would say, is just the teams at the really large, especially the hyperscalers, are growing like mad. When I mentioned that Amazon's chip design team has probably gone from 100 people to well over a thousand in the last five years. And if you look at the headcount growth at even a chip specific company like NVIDIA, the process is similar. And I think what you're seeing now is there's just for a long time, like in the 2000s, chips were all about PCs. In the 2010s, they were all about smartphones basically. And now everyone kind of knows that chips go into everything. And so 
there are just so many different applications to be designing semiconductors for. And so there's kind of like just this overall renaissance in chip design in the industry that's probably a, a modest tailwind also. And as they're successful, they're able to layer on these new businesses that are really additive to the overall business. So even they may not even be increasing price in a lot of cases, just selling more functionality because chip designers need it. And it's a really important point to underscore that we're talking about this $550 billion TAM of semiconductors and the TAM of devices on top of that is another step function. It's being enabled by this sort of $10 billion EDA TAM. It's really small when you think about what they're delivering. So clearly from our NZS terms, they're creating way more value than they're taking. I love to think about industries through that framework of the $100 barrel of oil and how much does it cost just to move on the pipeline? And should that be the same if it's at 100 versus 40? And when you frame it in those terms, 500 versus 10, it's not over earning or over capturing the economics relevant to its relevance. It kind of goes back to this pricing conversation. I mean, it basically just took the industry's willingness to grow up a little bit and say, like, we're providing so much value for this whole ecosystem that can't literally kind of exist without us. And so it just doesn't make sense that you would beat us up for three to 5% price declines or whatever it is every year. That just didn't make intuitive sense to me when I started looking at the industry 10 or 15 years ago. And so to their credit, they've kind of worked their way out of it. And I think are starting to occupy the space they um, deserve a little more. Cooperative competition. It's very important to have that in industries and they'll never tell you that it's the case, but it certainly helps. And the less they say, sometimes the better. So certainly understand that. As investors, I'm curious how you think about the R&D line. It sounds like today you're getting some benefit of scale based on how they're spending that R&D and being able to potentially spread that around towards more revenue items or thinking about that as having broader applicability. As some of these new technologies, new end markets pop up. Is that something that you expect to be somewhat cyclical in nature? And again, from like an investor perspective, what do you like to see from Cadence in terms of the R&D investment and where that's trending? I've thought about this a lot and the R&D intensity of the business and why does Cadence need to be 35% when so, which is a really complex business, could be 25% or whatever their R&D intensity is. There definitely is just a general maintenance level of R&D intensity because Cadence is also moving their tools down Moore's Law and designing the next two nanometer chip, which they're probably partnering with TSMC on right now and just how to like get that process ready. It's a very, very people intensive business. But I think what they've done a really good job on, and I've kind of watched this, is the basic return on their R&D is just revenue growth. And there is obviously a lag it was very R&D intensive for them to turn around their digital franchise and go from being an afterthought to actually taking market share there. And then some of their their newer priorities, I mean, two of them, they're probably worth talking about, are they're actually putting artificial intelligence into their software and you can use deep learning to actually optimize the process of designing a chip. And if you can either simplify the process for a customer, if they can do something with 10% fewer people, we're talking about $50 million that a customer could save. So that is massive. And then another big priority for the CEO who just moved into the seat in the last few months, Root Devgan, is moving into more simulation type applications. And so doing something similar to what Ansys would do, where you're doing computational fluid dynamics or thermal electromagnetics and things like that. And part of that's just because we're hitting the, the wall of Moore's Law to some extent. And so there's just a lot of creative ways that you can package chips together that we're going to need to pull off to keep this performance improvement going. And that takes a lot of different applications. And so the punchline is, as long as the revenue growth stays at the threshold where it's at, and I think you have to kind of trust the management team that they can invest intelligently, and they are pulling off these really healthy incremental margins, you can kind of see the business going into like the low or even mid 40s on an operating margin basis in the next five or six years, which is pretty healthy for a company, a software company with $3 billion in sales. Yeah, I'm always interested in businesses where investors are comfortable with CapEx or R&D, which might be elevated relative to industry peers. And it's generally driven by an understanding that's delivered from management exactly where that R&D and that CapEx is going and taking a longer view in terms of why it's necessary to spend it, because the absolute worst thing I can imagine doing in this space is being behind on R&D and then losing some type of share and trying to play catch up. We talked a lot about the two major players in the industry. I'm curious, when you think about competition, are there any other players, threats, up-and-comers that are a risk to Cadence? We've brought up Ansys a few times. They're actually kind of the number four player 
in EDA, they acquired a company called Apache a long time ago. And there are so many different sub-segments of, of EDA, but there are other companies that have come in. And I would say generally like the lines between EDA, like chip design software and like mechanical cab that Dassault or Siemens would sell those lines are kind of blurring and also with simulation from a company like Ansys. The other two vectors for competition, I mean, China has kind of woken up to the idea that they're way too reliant on the U.S. for some really key inputs to their chip efforts. And a big one of those is EDA software. And so there are homegrown Chinese efforts to spin up their own tools. And so that I think over the long term is probably, I mean, the benefit for Cadence is they've been doing this for 30 plus years. And so just the learnings of having delivered designs for customers for a very long time on something very technical, it'll take a long time for any Chinese efforts to catch up. One that I think is pretty interesting that doesn't get talked about very much is Google has actually done some of their own tools internally. The way that Google generally does things like this is, this is kind of a point tool. They can't design the whole chip with their own stuff. But if you look at TensorFlow or other Google efforts over the years, they generally open source these kind of things. And so could there be some sort of a open source platform for certain parts of the EDA software flow in five or 10 years. I think that's possible. I don't, I don't think it would disrupt Cadence and Synopsys, but it couldn't like eat away at their revenue growth around the edges or something like that. I think that's something that people should be aware of. I'm curious your thoughts. We've talked a lot about democratization and the broader unbundling of the industry and having all these individual players in the ecosystem. Is there any potential that you could see that start to come back together and, and see more vertical integration at various points in the ecosystem? We've come a little bit full circle with a lot of systems companies used to make chips and then they kind of got out of that business for a long time. And then as we've talked about, you know, Apple got back into the business and now Amazon and Google. So that part of it, the big platforms designing their own chips is definitely like a trend that's here to stay. And part of that is as long as you have capital, just everything else is so democratized. It's not that hard to design your own chips. Like Britain and I, theoretically, tomorrow, if we could raise a couple hundred million dollars, could start a chip company and design it. And you're seeing that even in the VC ecosystem right now, that you're seeing some pretty healthy fundraising with that in mind. Equipment that you buy from ASML or KLA or, or LAM, like that has just gotten so complex and the needs of Moore's Law are just so heavy that I think it's highly unlikely you'll ever see that re-vertically integrate. What those companies do is so special. And again, it's one of these things. They've been doing it for 30 or 40 years and have learning cycles in the fabs and things like that. So that seems less likely. And I would say similarly on the EDA software front, it's just outside of point tools that are developed internally here and there. And like, I mean, Intel does still use some of their own tools that they've developed for a long time, but they're Intel with $80 billion in revenue. So it's a little bit unique. But the idea that more EDA could come in house over time, it just seems really unlikely to me in part because it's just not a huge pain point for the customer. It's like 2% of their sales and they just get so much value for what they're giving versus the effort to like re-engineer all this stuff that's been created over the last few decades. Yeah, you'd really need to see some sort of paradigm shift that's even tough to imagine for the current players to be significantly disrupted. The 10 billion versus 500 billion really <laughs> is key here. If that was 50 versus 500 or even higher than that, maybe, but I think it's a great point. I can think of a lot of software tools that we use in our business, which we would never even think about bringing in-house. It simplifies the thesis a lot of ways. The 500 is growing. It's not a stagnant industry. It's, it's growing quickly. Not to have, go on too much of a tangent, but this idea of a low tariff extractor, EDA at the end of the day is just like a very small tax on the growth of the semiconductor industry. And so that's a business model that's really helpful to look for when you can find it where it's not really a pain point for the customer, but they provide something super valuable. And you can look at that, whether it's wireless towers is another one or analog chips. I mean, there are a lot of little business models like this where you can invest in innovation without being painful for the customers. We've laid out the bull case, I think, just in terms of the steady growth and what can happen. We always like to talk about the 10x upside case. I think it have to play into some of the new end markets and what's being developed and some of the new things they're touching outside of the pure semiconductor space. But what would you point to in terms of if this were to be 10x where it is today in five years, what was the reasoning and, and what really drove that? Just given their business model, it's a very slow and steady. I think there are like upside cases, but that magnitude probably is not super likely. We don't really know this renaissance in the semiconductor industry with the shortages and everyone being focused on chips, whether it's Ford or Tesla or Google or Microsoft or even Alibaba. This is a global phenomenon. But I mean, I guess there could be a scenario where just overall semiconductor industry growth accelerates to 
low double digits, and then R and D starts growing mid teens, and then cadence is growing kind of high teens or twenty percent, which would be a really healthy acceleration from here. And then you know there aren't that many mature software companies putting up that kind of growth, and the margin impact would be pretty dramatic. So I guess that would be the way I would build it up in my head. It's kind of like the blue sky scenario where the business could be multiples bigger, maybe five to 10 years than it is today. And the incremental fall through would be pretty powerful on a business like that. We sometimes break these up between sort of resilient companies and optional companies. And when we think about optional companies, we do see 10x scenarios. I would call this a more resilient company. So to get 10x, you need to trade something. And what you trade is probability. So if you get 10x, then maybe it's a 10% probability it's 10x. What I would say for a company like this, probability of them growing bottom line 15% a year for five years, which all equals a double in five years, is fairly high. So a 2x over five years, you know, with a pretty high probability is maybe better than a 10x over five years with a pretty low probability. And that seems like a trade-off for us. And so that's the way we think about a company like this. Yeah, I love the framework. You talked a little bit about competition and some of the things that could evolve. But if you were to see this business shrink materially from a value perspective over the five years, the bear case scenario, what would you point to there as being most likely reasoning why, even if it is a low probability? Yeah, I like the way you asked it because I do think it's a relatively low probability just given how mission critical Cadence is to their customers and how mission critical just like R&D is for Cadence's customers as well. But I would say there is a risk out of China, especially I mean, China's, I think, high teens percent of sales, whether that's something geopolitical where we have banned Huawei from using US-based EDA tools, we could ban every Chinese chip company from doing that potentially, especially under a different administration, that wouldn't seem crazy. And so that I would say is part of it. And then if we got to a point where this open sourcing concept, I think that's actually more likely there'd be something out of left field where Google does their own tools and open sources it the way open sourced TensorFlow and it built momentum. That to me would be a lot more likely than like someone goes out and raises money or even like one of Cadence's peers goes out and makes a big acquisition or something like that. Like this stuff is just so sticky and there's so much history. There's just like the macro variable that for some reason we just stop needing chips anymore. We just kind of hit the wall and Moore's law and people decide to stop building really big, sophisticated chips. And like our next iPhone has the same chip as last year's, which also, at least for the next 10 years, seems pretty unlikely. That would be the other scenario where EDA and Cadence specifically would suffer. There is market share. I mean, market share shifts between Cadence and Synopsys and it's relatively stable, but there's always risk that there's emerging differences in the competitive dynamics of who's going to be the best at incorporating AI into their tools, for instance. And that's a relatively new development in, in EDA. And so you could see some share shift around, but I don't think that would be massively disruptive. It'd be more on the margin. Just as we think about companies with time on their side, I mean, there's certainly we will get through the supply chain issues at some point in our lifetimes. Things will loosen up again. There will be geopolitical risk, whether it's China or Russia or whoever else. So, you know, Huawei went from a relatively big chip company to not a big chip company very quickly, but the chips are going to get built. We've heard ASML, the management team from ASML say this a number of times. It doesn't really matter where so much they get built. They're going to get built. We're not going to go back to using flip phones. Probably not. Probably not going to go back to driving cars with carburetors and sort of no electronics or automatic safety systems. Probably not going to go back to pencil and paper rather than Excel. So the trends are, are very clear. Now there's a lot of jigs and jags along the way, but from a longer term perspective, it seems pretty clear. Great answer from both sides of things. We close these episodes out with lessons for investors, for operators, any takeaways you have from the process of looking at this business over a long period of time, studying it, getting to know it. So what would you point to as a lesson or two for, I think investors would be the right listener base here that you've taken away from Cadence? I think the biggest one for me is just the power of positive structural change in an industry is incredible. And so there were like multiple changes that really powered the Cadence story, but both of the leaders transitioning to subscription model, pricing getting better, their customer base getting healthier, the overall semiconductor industry starting to grow a little faster and, and actually consolidating and having a healthy R&D base. I mean, even within EDA, there was consolidation that was helpful that we didn't actually cover that much. And so to me, I just think that's really fruitful hunting ground for looking for really powerful investments even seen it in other parts of semiconductors like memory or semi-cap equipment where you saw similar dynamics. And so to me, that's the big one. And then the other one I think about a lot is 
just the power of being supremely mission critical to your customers. Like everyone kind of says software is like firstly in debt, but this is like the stickiest software out there. Maybe ERP is a sticky, but it's like people will fire up their EDA software when they're like, can't even afford to keep the lights on kind of thing, you know? And so I think that's just an important lesson to keep relearning. And also it's honestly helps you sleep well at night owning, uh, owning a stock where you just know that they're going to get paid by their customers in any environment, no matter what. Did they see any impacts during COVID? I know a lot of various software platforms saw some type of price adjustments on the back of COVID, which I think was a little bit of a dent in the thesis of the quality of that whole first lean thesis. Did Caden see any impact from COVID, any adjustments on the contract side of things? The one thing they'll do, and I think this is actually a really smart thing for the management team to do, is if there are companies that are in, if there are customers that are in dire straits and they need a little bit of help for like a six to 12 month time horizon, they will help them out. They even did this back before COVID, but there were some companies that were taken private in the big private equity boom and were kind of strapped for cash because they were like eight times levered, but they're big customers. And so Cadence so would kind of work with them, but that's more about just finding a middle ground than their customers not being able to pay, if that makes sense. And the lesson for me is, I'm just going to key off of what John just talked about. It's really this idea of non-zero sumness, which is a complicated way to say they create more value than they take. Clearly creating more value than they take. Libu came in and and got really close with the customers, really spent a lot of time understanding what the customers needed from Cadence, what they could do in terms of their R&D roadmap that would be helpful for their customers. So we took this really long-term view, got close with the customer and says, probably not going to solve everything in the next quarter, but over five years, we can make a big dent in it. And so that high quality management team, which went to the growth and gave this 13% growth that John is talking about even better on the bottom line. Clearly, the company has time on their side. You add all those things together in this wrapper of creating massive value for your customers and the probabilities get really good. Yeah, I love lessons that can be taken from businesses that have been around for a while and hit this pivot point where they saw some type of renaissance or revival that shot them up. I think it's it's always really interesting to look at those relative to something that's just been a rocket since launch. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> well, thank you, Brenton. Thank you, John. This was incredibly informative. Appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having us, Matt. Yeah, Matt, thanks a lot for having us. It was fun. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 